Good morning, I'm Dr Mark Bailey. Three disclaimers are necessary. I'm also a Lieutenant Commander MTO, Maritime Trade Operations, but I'm not representing the MTO Capability Manager, Captain Beard, who's in the audience. Secondly, while I'm currently serving in the Director of Naval Capability Planning, I'm not, not representing um, BNCP, Commodore Spedding, who's also in the audience, it would kill me if I tried. And third, what I am doing is giving a wide spectrum academic assessment here as the only current PhD in the protection of maritime trade. Um, and for the midshipmen present, it's a wide open field and there's plenty of greens bossed in it. This presentation is linked to a second unique academic SME present here, Mrs Misha de Vogel, to my knowledge the only person ever to do a PhD in Australian war finances. This presentation is built around the example of the most recent loss of uncontested strategic dominance of the South China Sea, which is an Australian Strategic Policy Institute um, example. Historical background. In 1912, the British Board of Trade created this little document. Every ship was required to report its position. You can see the structure of the fully globalised world trade at that time. It shows the two imperial heartlands. The Indian Ocean littoral is not often recognised for what it really was. The physical structures changed and the scale has changed. The British Empire had a total freight task of 130 million tonnes. That's 30 million tonnes less than the freight task, just the coal exports out of the Port of Newcastle in 2015. So there's a massive scale change here. Of note, the 1920s to, Sing 1920s to 40s Singapore strategy assumed loss of strategic control of the South China Sea and it was a trade protection strategy to, present, to prevent the Japanese from dominating the Indian Ocean. This might sound familiar for some reason. Shipping has got the two strategic components as CN discussed, sea supply and maritime trade, which is a subset, sea supply is a subset of maritime trade. There's vastly more shipping these days. We are more dependent on it than we were in 1912, but structurally only the scales changed. The range rings here still stand. They show DF-21 anti-ship ballistic missile range rings from the new Chinese island bases in the South China Sea. The Japanese flags represent the locations of the Japanese long-range maritime strike air bases from 1941. Um, of note, Japanese bombers could reach further than those range rings, which gives you some idea as to the problems they had back then. None of this is new. All, we've done all of this before. The Empire's response to this problem, contested control of the South China Sea, they spotted in 1920 and built a strategy to meet it. That was the earliest major example of international defence burden sharing and Australia was a, an integral part of it. In, 20, in 2016, the Hague, Arbit, the, ha, the Hague Arbitration Court banned China's belligerence and relying on the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, ruled China had seized Philippines territory and stolen Philippines resources. Beijing ignored the verdict. This mirrors Japanese actions of 1931 and 32. The Singapore strategy was designed to protect trade. Um, Firstly, it blocked the Japanese from entering the Indian Ocean. Secondly, it provided a base to contest control of the South China Sea. Thirdly, it provided the base and logistics to conduct a strategic counterattack against Japan. In doing so, it ensured that Australia could not be defeated by Imperial Japan. The parallels here are obvious. At the April China Masterclass Conference, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, ASPE, their view was that we had lost control of the South China Sea and that just like the last time, the obvious response was an international defence burden sharing arrangement. Signs of that include the Indo-Pacific Maritime Coordination Cell. The goal now is to prevent loss of uncontested control of the Indian Ocean, which the People's Republic of China directly threatens. As Ross Babbage notes in his very recent CSBA study on Chinese hybrid warfare, which I really do commend to you, we've lost, we have lost control of the South China Sea. Who remembers the infamous 10-year rule? He died in 1931 for the reasons shown on the screen. This has all happened before, when the British strategic assumptions on which their Asian defence policy was built imploded in 1931. You can see the parallels illustrated in black and red. As people at the back probably can't read the, uh, the writing there, the judge sitting in the middle, this is the International Court of the League of Nations in 1931, he's saying to Japan in the dock, who's carrying a submachine gun, a pistol and a knife, uh, the court orders you to respect the rule of law and sentences you to a good talking to. Japan's reply is, and I order the court to mind its own business and then I sentence it to go and chase itself. The international lawyers in the middle are frantically and uselessly working. 
The issue is not new in any way. We've got plenty of international precedent. There is no excuse, aside from willful ignorance of history, to pretend this is, is, un, is unusual, was unforeseeable, or that it poses no risk of generating regional or even global conflict, and CN was quite clear on that. There's also no excuse to pretend that the rules-based international order will be any more effective in 2019 as it was between 1931 and 1937, when Japan went from crisis and seizure of territory to general regional war. Don't forget that World War II really did start in 1937 in China. After all, Mao Zedong said that power grows out of the barrel of a gun, and he and the Chinese Communist Party have acted on that basis ever since, treating the rules-based international order with quite open contempt. Aspie noted that the PRC prioritised the primacy of national sovereignty and disregards international rules-based orders, and have drawn comparisons with the actions of Japan. Please note the congruence there between the Chinese defence zones, shown here, the rather shocking illustration that Aspie put up, which was Japanese expansion in 1942, and the Chinese island chains. International trade will move into those zones once they gain control under Chinese sufferance or under escort, or not at all. Carrying capacity, I'm not doing PowerPoint for the blind, there's a lot of information on the sides. Carrying capacity refers not to a ship's cargo, but to the carrying capacity of the system, which includes landside distribution networks and the ports. Active conflict will create a declared war zone within or adjacent to the first island chain. That will drive shipping away and onto new routes. This will seriously impact the carrying capacity of the global shipping fleet. It'll make voyages longer, driving up freight rates and forcing our government to implement war risk insurance schemes per 1914 and 1939 if they want to avoid economic collapse. None of this is new. We did it all before 1914, 1938, 1939-45. That's the Commonwealth War Book, the last edition of it from October 1956. It is the very tip of a vast array of plans across all government departments and includes the creation of entire, entirely new ministries to deal with war. Question. Has any whole of government planning has any, any of the whole of government planning necessary for national mobilisation been done? Or is our equivalent of the Commonwealth War Book? In the event of one of Aspie's scenarios eventuating, insurance rates will, will increase, we'll need to do the war risk insurance zone. Let's have a look at the actual trade itself. Australian liquid natural gas comes out of West Australia, Queensland, Northern Territory, and steaming coal from New South Wales and Queensland. This is sea supply for the, for the five big Japanese baseload electricity supplies. Without it, their economy stops. Rerouting the trades to avoid the South China Sea would be the first naval coordination and guidance of shipping step. Used to, that's the new name for what used to be called naval control of shipping. The second is evasive routing on these new routes to meet whatever threat there is. That includes, and I'm not joking, mine lays off the coast by disguised mine layers, disguised ocean surface raiders and submarines. Yes, they're old threats. There's a fair bit of information coming out of various sources I tap into, that the Chinese are actually talking about those sorts of tactics for very long-range projection of sea power. All three are proven and well-known, all three cost carrying capacity. For example, evasive routing increases the distance by about 5%. You lose 5% of your carrying capacity. Convoy, depending on the area, 10 to 15%. Question, is the current RE and Maritime Trade organisa Operations Organisation large enough and sufficiently trained to do this? Have we exercised with the Japanese, for example? Using the ASPE scenario, war risk will be, was, will be the first great crisis as it was in 1914. Ships will not leave port uninsured. On the day World War I began, not one ship left port. It was implemented automatically in 1939. And again, a question. What's the current state of Australian maritime war risk insurance legislation and planning? About day five, We'll hit the issue of requisition and cargo import and export control. In World War I, this, that had been foreseen, work had been done for about 20 years. It wasn't quite enough. They wound up doing massive machinery of government changes on the fly. It worked, but it didn't work very well. It was quite inefficient in some areas. 1939, it was all locked down in the 1939 version of that, which was a fair bit thicker. Question. Has Australian legislation and regulation related to the requisition in the law of angry, the ability to requisition neutral ships, been updated? A second question, as the Australian Commonwealth War Book hasn't been updated in two generations, what's the current state of our legislation and planning to meet a crisis of this nature? 
Let's get into some details. The example here is the port of Dampier. As you can see, a lot of trade goes out of Dampier. Now in 2018, Australia's exports were 344 billion. This is exports by sea. Imports 304 billion. Um, John Blackburn will do will delve more deeply into these sorts of details. The implications here are that should, for example, China be blockaded, there would be an actual shortage of tonnage to move iron ore to Japan because of the number of ships which are Chinese flagged. There will also be a severe shortage of liquid natural gas tankers. They are a critical sea supply to the Japanese and will be first, off, first cab off the rank for convoy. Turning to Port Headland, I'll give you a couple of... Um, a few seconds to have a look through those figures. Um, this example really focuses on the Pilbara iron ore trade to give an insight into the effect of losing or diverting trades around the South China Sea. Currently 87.6% of the trade from these two ports is iron ore exports to China. But that will not free up a vast amount of tonnage because most of the ships carrying it are Chinese. Going to the East Coast, East Coast coal ports. These trades form the steaming and coking coal backbones of the Japanese, South Koreans and Chinese national economies. Think about the leverage that might provide. CN touched on that point. Loss of the Chinese merchant fleet would probably leave enough carrying capacity to maintain these trades to Japan and South Korea. Interestingly, these go up through the Bismarck Sea. We happen to be putting, uh, up, helping update the PNG naval base there. And old threats, yes, and you again. The Chinese look very closely at history and appear to be examining these concepts, the ones on the screen. The maximum opportunity for covert mine laying and surface raiders exists in the first 12 months of any conflict. If combined with methods to shut down AIS and disrupt civil ship identification systems, merchant ships converted to these roles would be effective. A very simple $35, $35 million, 8,000 tonne geared cargo vessel. Um, carry 1,000 mines on one of those that is without a problem. Um, even sent against us and against the USA, even century-old moored mines with a modern refit sensor package would severely disrupt our trade. Modern ground mines are even more so, of course. One empty 80,000 cubic metre LNG membrane tanker cost about 200 million US dollars. That's empty, full, it's about uh, 520 million. Disguised surface raiders would have similar disruptive effects. They've been effective since the 15th century. Question. What's the state of our ability to monitor, to monitor merchant shipping in a cyber conflict, non-AIS or MCON environment? Second question. To provide the same general level of coverage for 60% of our trade as we did in 1939, we'd need 13 harbour defence mine countermeasures units and about 30 auxiliary warships. If you want to be able to protect in any way, shape or form the other ports, we have 31 ports through which... 90% of our trade goes, we need about 90 auxiliary warships. How's the planning going for that? In conclusion, we are here examining a number of issues. The issues are not new and we've sorted out answers to these issues several times before. We have under our historic belts the experience of the largest, most complex, most successful and least understood examples of international burden sharing in modern history and the largest and most successful in terms of protecting the shipping on which Australia is existentially dependent. We can learn a lot from what they did before to solve those problems. That book illustrates the point. MTO mirrors the old Naval Control Service. NCAGS mirrors Naval Control of Shipping. So the system created to solve the problem still exists in a different and perhaps even remnant form, and one which would demand expansion, some regularisation and deeper and more extensive international coordination and burden sharing in planning for a wider conflict, a wider conflict. Very importantly, industry understands that. It's worth noting that in 1923, when Cabinet accepting the then NCS Naval Control Shipping Liability, the Naval Control Service, the modern equivalent's MTO, required 650 men at a time when RAN regular strength was, was about 3,000. What followed was a vast but low-key and low-cost international global effort in the NCS field all through the interwar years. That was a war winner in 1939, when global shipping was seamlessly taken under control planet-wide in 24 hours without a hitch. That was an astounding achievement when you think about it, and no, they didn't have a single computer, card systems all the way. Being where we are, perhaps I should answer the part of the question I opened with. As the maritime trade heartland of the world, Asia, shows dangerous parallels to the 1930s, we are not as well prepared to deal with it as was the empire by 1938. So what do we do about it? 
perhaps we should think more deeply. Perhaps we should be guided by the history of those times, not directed, guided. We should certainly relink history with policy development as the United States Navy is doing right now through the Hattendorf Historical Centre. We should learn what we did before, reveal the lessons and the capability demands required, and then plan for them within the modern context. Really, the only thing hard about this is changing our cultural mindset. Thank you.